What's up, Ozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to another audiobook. So, we have read through Prankster, um, it came out today, and now we're going to read Kids at Play! There we go, that rhymed. <laughs> oh, if it rhymes, it's true, that's the motto in life. Um, yeah, we're going to be reading through this. <clears throat> Prankster is really short, so I'm expecting Kids at Play and Fine Player 2 to be a little bit longer. So, um, buckle in, get some popcorn, uh, and let's read the story together. I'm excited for this one. I'm very excited for this one. I have no idea what's going to happen, so let's get straight into it. You're not going to be a kid forever, Joel. As if I'd want to be, Joel muttered. He was just a few steps from his pickup. Two more seconds. That was all he'd needed to get his ride and get away before he was caught. Two freaking seconds. Joel sighed with enough volume, head roll, and shoulder action to communicate his annoyance, and he turned to glare at his dad. What now? It's only 5.53. He decided to play dumb. Your point? You're off at 6, not 5.53? You're nagging me about 7 minutes? Joel's dad looked up at the hazy blue sky for a minute, and then wiped the back of his hand across his forehead. His palm, of course, was perfectly clean. How'd he do that? Joel had been working at the family business, as his mother liked to call his dad's business, D'Agostino's Nursery and Garden Center after school, and every summer since he turned 14. The job had been four years of near-daily torture, shoveling, lifting, carting, weeding, and saying yes ma'am and yes sir and whatever you'd like, when what he really wanted to say was... Well, something totally different, and not even a little polite. Ever since... Oops. I just messed around. Uh, ever since he had started working for his dad, Joel had smelled like sweat and dirt, or worse, manure. His mother, who used to tell him daily how much she loved him, had replaced her I love you with take a shower, Joel. When he'd complained that it wasn't his fault that he smelled all the time, it was a stupid job, she countered with, your dad's been running D'Agostino's for 25 years and he never goes around stinking like a cow turd steaming in a mud pile, oh god. <laughs> no chill. Yeah, his dad. The perfect man. The one everyone loved. The guy who never sweat. The dude who was so special that dirt and fertiliser didn't have the audacity to touch him. Joel blinked and realised his dad was talking. He tuned into the words and came in mid-sentence. Think you're gonna find an employer who isn't going to care who isn't going to care you leave work a few minutes early every day? You can't be irresponsible forever. God knows I've cut you more slack than I should have. Your mother kept asking me to go easy on you, and what's that gotten us? An eighteen year old who acts like an eight year old, that's what. You're a screw up, Joel. A total screw up. Joel took a deep breath and wrinkled his nose at the sickly sweet smell of cherry blossoms, which were blooming late this year for some reason. They kept dripping pink bits all over the nursery, which the breeze would then pick up and blow around. Joel's dad insisted on a clean nursery, which meant no fallen blossoms were allowed to litter the property. Joel had probably swept up several million of the damn things today alone. Joel put his hands on his narrow hips, Several girls had told him he looked gorgeous when he did that. He cocked his head and at his dad. Are you done yet? His dad threw up his hands and bellowed. You're fired. Joel frowned. Okay, so he hated the job. However, his dad paid him $2 an hour above any other wage Joel had been able to find. And at least the job was a daytime job. Everything else he'd looked into required working late nights, which would cut into his time with the band until he could skip town, which wasn't going to be until graduation, two long months away. The truth was that working at the nursery was the best job he had available at the moment. And he had to have a job. He couldn't pile up the money he needed to get to LA if he didn't keep working. He faced his dad. You can't fire me because I'm leaving work seven minutes early. Oops, nope, I said that completely wrong. You can't fire me because I'm leaving work seven minutes early. Steve Dagos... D'Agostino, I think I am saying that right, Steve D'Agostino looked around as feigned confusion crossed his dark face. Joel blinked. He'd just gotten that weird feeling that sometimes felt 
um, when he looked at his dad, like he was looking at an older version of himself. When his dad widened his brown eyes like that, he looked a lot like Joel, who'd received most of his strong features from his dad, but whose eyes were as big and heavily lashed as his mum's. It was a good combination. Once a lady had come up to him in a grocery store to ask if, she, if he was a model, that in fact was something he planned to do when he got to LA. It would support him while he got his music career going. Am I suffering under a delusion here? Joel's dad asked. Is it not true that as the owner of this place, I can do whatever I darn well please? Is there some other boss around here I haven't heard about? Some dude, he was mimicking Joel's frequent use of the word, who gets to call the shots? Funny dude, Joel said. I'm just saying, it's stupid to fire someone for leaving seven minutes early. You think so, huh? His dad's voice was louder now. Let's do the math, shall we? Joel looked around to see if anyone was watching him get lectured by a dumb, like a dumb little kid. A couple old biddies were inspecting the leaves on the cherry trees at the edge of the parking lot. A family was clustered around the plastic pinwheel lawn ornaments near the front door of the garden centre. At the far side of the nursery, Joel's co-worker Seth shoveled beauty bark into the back of one of the delivery trucks. Good, no one of consequence was found. Joel glanced at his watch. It was now 6pm. He interrupted his dad's droning calculations and tapped his watch. Well, now I'm not leaving early. You think you're a funny guy, don't you? Joel's dad shook his head. I don't need to do the maths. I've already done it. Over the time you've spent working for me, I've paid you more than 67 hours beyond what you've actually worked. That's easily a thousand dollars you got for doing absolutely nothing. Joel shrugged. So what? I'm your son. You owe me. Joel's dad stared at Joel for 10 solid seconds. After the first three, Joel thought about getting in his truck and leaving, but for some reason, he couldn't look away from his dad. When Joel was little, he thought his dad was the coolest guy on the planet. Unlike his friend's dads, Joel's dad was big and broad-shouldered and fit, kind of like a superhero. He didn't drive a boring old sedan like other dads, he drove a great big shiny black truck. His dad also didn't wear typical fatherly attire, like drab khakis and polo shirts either. When Joel's dad wasn't at the nursery, he dressed in flashy clothes, dressy slacks and, and, and bright shirts and patent ties. People around town loved Steve D'Agostino. <laughs> he could make a crowd erupt in laughter, charm any woman, befriend anyone he wished. At home, he was funny and attentive. When Joel was a kid, his dad had been fun. Father and son would spend the summers joking around and doing cool things together. Joel's dad played guitar, and he taught his son early on, instilling, him, instilling in him a love of music. He even brought Joel a, a drum set when Joel asked for one, and they'd formed a two-person rock band. Something weird had happened, though. When Joel had reached his teens, the rules changed. He was no longer allowed to play and do whatever he wanted to do. His dad expected something of Joel that he just couldn't give. His dad wanted him to stop having fun. He wanted Joel to get serious and grow up. After a while, Joel stopped fighting it. By sophomore year, he was all for growing up. Uh, oh, sorry, he was all for growing up because it meant he could get away from his smothering parents and this backwards small town. It meant he could go play music where someone would appreciate him instead of yelling at him for it. But why did growing up have to mean getting serious? Why did he have to have why did he have to stop having fun? Joel blinked when he felt a tug and heard a rip. He looked down. What the? His dad had just torn off the name tag from his shirt with such force it left a hole. I'm done with you, his dad said. Just get out of here. Joel felt blood flood his face. His temples throbbed. He clenched his fists. Now, his dad growled. Joel threw up his hands. Fine. He turned and yanked open the door of his pickup. Joel flung himself behind the wheel, pulling his long legs into the cab and slammed the door. He heard gravel crunching and looked out the driver's side window to see his dad walking back to the garden centre. Whatever. Joel turned the ignition key. Once, twice, three times... The old engine finally turned over and sputtered before settling into a chug-like rumble. Joel slammed his hand against the steering wheel. His dad thought he'd done Joel so many freaking favours, like buying this pickup. I bought you a truck, Joel, 
His dad often said to him while Joel was complaining about not getting something he wanted. So what? It was a 20 year old pickup with standard transmission. Thanks for small favours dude, Joel thought. Joel slapped the gear shift into reverse. He ground the gears and the truck shot backward. He could hear gravel flying under the pickup's chassis. I don't know, I don't know what that word is. Um, he hoped he was leaving big furrows in his dad's precious, the gravel needs to be kept smooth and even, parking lot. It would serve the jackass right. Joel ground the gears again as he shifted into first. He pressed hard on the accelerator and the engine whined, protesting the excessive speed in low gear. Joel quickly shifted through second and third as he kept accelerating. He exited the parking lot at 45 miles per hour in third gear. Gravel was still flying. He heard it ping off the D'Agostino sign at the front edge of the parking lot. His tires squealed as he careened out into the road. Someone honked, but he didn't even look behind him to see why. He just put the accelerator to the floor and took the truck up to over 60 miles per hour as quickly as the old geezer of a vehicle would allow. Another car honked. Someone shouted. Joel didn't care. D'Agostino's was just outside the so-called downtown, a pathetic scraggly collection of, drying businesses, of dying businesses scattered over several semi-abandoned blocks. The garden centre or nursery complex was on the main road, a narrow two-lane pothole-filled strip of pavement that eventually led to a state highway. Although it was the main road, the speed limit was only 30 miles per hour. Stupid slow. The D'Agostino family house was just three miles from the nursery. Joel liked to see how fast he could drive the short distance. Today, he couldn't get home fast. He needed to get back to his room and get on his drum pads. He wanted to pound out his frustration. If he could have gone to his buddy Zach's place to play drums for real, he would have, but Zach and his family weren't home today. Some kind of family thing. Zach's dad didn't want Joel or the other members of the band coming over when no one was there. Joel took the turn off the main road so fast that his tyres squealed again. He grinned and accelerated onto the straightaway that ran west of the main street. A few blocks later, he was in the heart of the old town residential area, the neighbourhood of big gnarled trees and sloping green lawns and uppity Victorian houses where all the town somebodies lived, the families who had been here forever. Joel actually thought these families, which included his own, were the nobodies, the people too stupid to see that their own town was a waste of space, the people too lazy or scared or stupid to leave and try some place else. The thought of these immovable families, all the old ways of thinking and the endless judgments and criticisms like those of his dad pissed off Joel so much that his foot jammed down the accelerator even harder and he took the next turn faster than he'd ever taken it before. He took it so fast that he went into a skid. For a couple seconds, he had no control over the vehicle. He slid around the corner, his tyres jittering over the uneven pavement. Joel let out a whoop of exhilaration. It felt great to be untethered to the rules, to what was right. It was... The back of his truck hit something with a heavy whump, followed by a crack. Oops. It sounded like he'd taken out a mailbox. Joel sighed and slammed on his brakes. The truck lurched to a stop, throwing him forward and back and rocking for a couple seconds as he shoved the gear shift into neutral and set the parking brake. He let the engine idle as he got out to see what he'd crunched. Not that he cared a lot, but getting him in trouble didn't serve his purposes right now, especially given that his dad had fired him. He needed to suck up to someone to get a better job, and most of the someone's worth uh, sucking up to lived in this neighbourhood. If he'd broken a mailbox, he should probably fix it. Joel walked around his truck and looked down at the shoulder. He lifted his brows. He hadn't hit a mailbox. A three foot tall neon yellow green plastic figure vaguely shaped like a kid lay on the, its side in the dirt behind Joel's truck. The kid held a triangular orange flag that had the words kids at play printed in black. The colour of the sign matched the orange hat that was moulded across the top of the kid's plastic head. Across what could have been called the figure's hips, the word slow shined under a red reflector. Joel, la Joel laughed. Heck of a lot of good... Wait, heck of a lot of good the little dude had just done now. Joel hadn't even seen it, much less 
felt compelled to heed its stupid warning. He noticed the plastic figure's legs were cracked, probably as a result of their impact with Joel's truck. No big deal, the figure would still work. Joel started to turn away from the figure, but for some reason it's loud... Uh, sorry, it's loud? Its large, round, black eyes and gaping, empty mouth caught his attention. He paused. Goosebumps formed on his bare arms as he stared into the sightless, lifeless little face. He shook his head and rubbed his eyes. Whatever, Joel said out loud. He looked around. He was alone. So he once again started to return to his truck. And again, he stopped. This time, his attention was caught by a disgusting sludge pile by the plastic figure's feet. What was that? It wasn't mud. It wasn't dog doo-doo. It was... Joel bent over to see the sludge more clearly, and he immediately recoiled. The brownish lumpy mass looked like a dog had melted into a semi-liquid ooze. Joel took a step back and made a face. That's gross. Is it agony? Dunno. <laughs> Probably not. Thoroughly creeped out, Joel rotated once more to see if anyone was watching him. He didn't see a soul on the street, and all the houses either had pulled curtains or darkened windows. Joel hurried back to his open driver's door and jumped into the truck. Putting it in gear, he popped off the brake and drove away as fast as he could without squealing the tyres. He didn't want to make more sound than was necessary. Why? Because it might wake the sleeping plastic kid? Joel snorted at the thought. Yeah, right. He muttered. He turned on his radio to drown out the remaining heebie-jeebies that tickled the hairs at the back of his neck. Joel's mum was waiting for him when he pulled his pickup into the driveway. She stood on the covered wraparound porch, hands buried in the pockets of her high-waisted mum jeans. Even from 30 feet away, Joel could see her furrowed brows and her compressed lips. She was obviously pissed about something. Great. He was tempted to take off again, but he was still feeling weird because of the plastic kid thing. He wanted to go up to his room and shut out the world. To do that, he'd have to get past his mum. Joel was an only child, and as such, he always figured he should be appropriately spoiled and coddled. His best friend, Wes, was also an only child, and Wes got whatever he wanted whenever he wanted it. Joel, however, had parents who were committed to making sure he wasn't spoiled. Over the years, he tried to manipulate them into getting him what he wanted, but he'd given up at some point. You have to go to work for what you get in life, Joel. His parents were always telling him. If we give you everything, you won't know how to make your way in the world. I'd figure it out, he told them. Why not give me a few easy years before I get to the hard ones? They didn't find his reasoning persuasive or his humour amusing. Unlike Wes's parents, who told him it was okay when he made C's and D's in school, Joel's parents not only lam lamented, lamented, sorry, lamented his poor grades, they punished him for them. His truck was a perfect example of that. When Joel had gone to high school, his dad told him that he'd buy Joel a new truck when Joel got his license, provided he got good grades. For every semester he got bad grades, the truck he received would be a year older. Joel tried to get good grades for a semester, but it was too much work. It cut into his music playing and hanging out time. So, he did the math and figured a five-year-old truck wasn't such a bad thing. He gave up trying to get decent grades. When it came time for him to get his truck, his dad told Joel how disappointed he was in Joel's school performance. Joel proudly told his dad his reasoning for being lazy, which turned out to be a bad move. His dad was so angry that he punished Joel for his impertinence by taking off another 15 years from the new truck. That was how Joel ended up with a 20-year-old truck. You should be glad your dad bought you a truck at all, Joel's mother had said when he complained it uh, about it to her. She always took his dad's side. Your father is a wonderful man, a great father. He does his best for this family. She's said more times than Joel wanted to remember. Now he could tell by his mother's angry scowl that getting past her wasn't going to be easy. He decided to try acting innocent and clueless and see what that got him. He got out of his truck and waved at his mum casually. Hey mum. Don't you hey mum me, she snapped. Your father called. Joel sighed and looked toward his mother. 
He made sure he kept his shoulders back, his head high, and his stroll in its usually confident swagger. Mariana, the prettiest girl in his class, lived across the street. Her bedroom window looked out over the road. She'd never given him the time of day, but he figured there was always hope. After all, he made jeans and black t-shirts look hot. All the other girls thought so. They didn't seem to mind that he wasn't romantic or gentlemanly or any out of that crap. Or any... Any out of that crap? Any of that crap. <laughs> uh, he got dates whenever he wanted them. Mariana, though, was one date he couldn't get. Your charm is like a plastic wrap, Joel, she'd said once to him. What's that supposed to mean? He'd asked. It's thin, and because it's see-through, it doesn't cover up what a jerk you are. Joel flicked a glance at Mariana's window as he walked toward his mother. If she was watching, the only two women he wanted to impress were seeing him at a very low point. That sucked. Joel stepped up onto the porch and looked him and looked in his mum's dark eyes. Joel loved his mother, but she could be intimidating. She was a tall woman with sturdy body and she always wore no nonsense clothes, usually dark slacks or high waisted jeans and bright coloured blouses. Today's was magenta. Her features were kind of large for her face. She actually could have passed for a man if she hadn't worn her hair long, but she commanded attention. He couldn't look away from her when she was mad. Dad was in a mood, Joel tried. Cut it out, Joel. You know darn well you've pushed your dad beyond the limits any parent should have to endure. You show up late to work, do as little as possible while you're there, and you leave early. He was going to let it slide until you went off to college, but then... You announced that you weren't going to college, not that you could get in with your grades. At that point, your dad figured you need the money. So he kept you on, in spite of the fact that you're going to break his heart and go join a crazy rock band or whatever it is you plan to do. But even he has his breaking point. Joel looked at his feet. I'm sorry, Mum. He tilted his head and gave her the sideways glance that always used to make her melt. She blew out air. You're a good looking boy, Joel. I'll give you that, but looks won't get you everything. You need a little personality to go with them. And right now, yours needs a lot of work. Joel shrugged. I'm going to my room. His mum opened her mouth, then closed it, and made the shoe, uh, shoeing motion with her hand. Fine, go. Joel brushed past her and stomped into his house. He heard her sigh behind him as he tracked dirt across the grey tiled entryway. Served her right. He was kind of hungry and wanted a snack, but more than that, he wanted to be alone. He ran up the wide staircase to the second floor, strode down the hall and went into his room. Slamming the door, he started for the drumsticks, but instead grabbed his acoustic guitar from its stand in the corner of the room. He flopped on the bed with it. Curling his fingers over the frets, Joel concentrated on the latest, si uh, on the latest set of chords he was trying to master. They were bar chords, which he'd always had trouble with, same. <laughs> Getting the strength in his fingers necessary to hold down all the strings on the fret at once took hundreds of hours of practice, and even now, after years of playing, he struggled with some of the less common chords. He had to learn them though. He didn't want the music he was writing to be ordinary. He wasn't going to use the usual easy chords or the standard chord progressions. He wanted to create music that pushed boundaries. Boundaries. That was his whole problem. He was locked in by so many rules. They made him crazy. So crazy that he felt like he was a walking ball of anger all the time. He didn't mean to be, but he couldn't he, he couldn't help he, he couldn't seem to help himself. <laughs> he felt like a tiger trapped in a cage, a tiger so frustrated that it couldn't help but roar at everyone. Joel went through his new chords twice. Then he started combining them with complex picking. The mix sounded super cool. Joel grinned as a new song about breaking boundaries began to form in his head. But the fledging melody was silenced when Joel's mother threw open his bedroom door. Joel's fingers froze on the guitar. Joel's mum walked over to his dresser and put clean socks in the drawer. That sounded interesting, she said. Joel frowned. Interesting wasn't what he was going for, but he wasn't going to say anything. He never tried to explain his music to his parents. It wasn't for them to understand, it was for him. 
and for the fans he'd eventually have when he was able to leave this town and play some place where he'd be appreciated. Joel's mum flicked a look from Joel to the plush-backed stool that sat in the corner with his instruments. She put her hands on her hips. Why did we bother getting you that stool if you're going to slouch on your bed when you play the guitar? She shook her head and left his room, muttering to herself. As soon as she closed the bedroom door, Joel threw a pillow at it. Why did we bother? He mimicked her. Why did we bother? Was one of his mum's favourite lines. This line applied to anything she or Joel's dad did that she thought Joel should appreciate more. For instance, she loved to ask, why did we bother getting you nice clothes if you're not going to take care of them? And why did we bother getting you a tutor if you're not going to show up for your lessons? He never answered her when she asked these questions, but if he had, he'd have said something like, who asked for nice clothes? Jeans and t-shirts are fine. And when did I ask for a tutor? If he'd thought he could get away with it, he'd have the most to say in answer for her question about his room. Why did we bother decorating your room if you were going to trash it? Well, did Joel ask her to bring in a professional decorator to, co to, to coordinate just the right beige and blue striped curtains to go with the dark blue walls in his room? Did he ask for the custom oak study centre? Desk and credenza attached to built-in filing cabinets and shelves, and the matching crest the crest chest of drawers and nightstand and dresser. Did he care about the imported Turkish rug or the framed art pin prints of rare plants? Did he need the state of the art brushed steel ceiling fan and light? Did stuff like thread count and pillow shapes matter to him? Why did he need six decorative pillows anyway? When his room was straightened up the way his mum liked it, which only happened when either she or the housekeeper did it. The damn pillows took up most of his queen size bed. All Joel had ever wanted for his room was enough space for his drum set and guitars, a professional soundboard, and soundproofing. Instead, he got a room full of hoity-toity men's club-looking furniture and decorative crap, which forced him to cram his instruments, the only thing he did care about, into a corner. And the lack of soundproofing made it really hard to practice. His parents were always either making comments on music he wanted to keep to himself, or they were yelling at him to keep it down. The problem with Joel's mum and dad was that they decided what was right for him, and they got mad at him for having a different idea. He never got to choose for himself. Over the years, this had made him so resentful that he could no longer appreciate even the rare things that they did that he actually liked. Damn, this guy is a, is a, a bitch. <laughs> the problem with Joel's mum and dad was that they decided what was right for him, and they got mad at him for having a different idea. He never got to achieve... Wait. Never mind, we've read that. It was just a glitch thing. Uh, Joel gritted his teeth and started playing his guitar again. He sang softly along. Oh, God. Am I going to have to sing this? Um... Boundaries, stealing choice from me, shoving, forcing, making me not be me. That was wrong, but whatever. He stopped. That was lame. Yeah, it, it was very lame. <laughs> um, yeah. Joel sighed and laid back on his pillows, cradling his silent guitar. If only I could leave now, he thought. His dad had told him that if he didn't graduate from high school, Joel would never receive another penny from his dad. Not now. Not if he got in trouble. Not even after his dad was dead. Joel believed him. At the moment, he'd have been willing to give up any of that money just to get away, but he didn't have enough saved to make the trip, or to get his own place. He needed to stay at home a little longer. And now he had to find a new job. Unless he could find a way to make his dad forgive him. Maybe he could convince his dad to take him back. Joel thought about that for a while. Which was worse? Groveling to his dad, or going out and trying to find a different job? Both choices sucked, but he finally decided apologising would be less time-consuming than job hunting. By putting on what he thought was an award-worthy acting performance over a dinner of roast beef, red potatoes and peas, Joel was able to persuade his dad to let him keep working until the end of the school year. 
Joel had been all, I'm really sorry I've been acting like a jerk. And he'd thrown in a bunch of stuff, like, I've been doing a lot of thinking, and I get that I need to make some changes, and I think I've been taking things for granted. And, 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 and I'm not going to do that anymore. He thought his blah 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 lies had gone well with a blah meal. Joel's mum was into cooking simple food. She actually took classes on how to put together meals with the fewest ingredients possible. He wished she didn't have time for classes like that. The food was terribly bland. But she only had a part-time work-at-home hobby job writing knitting patterns and selling them online. This gave her too much time to discover new things like cooking simply. For the last two years, nothing they ate had any flavour. Last Christmas, he tried to fix that by spending some of his own money to buy a spice rack filled with 30 spices for his mum. She'd ended up giving away all but a dozen of the spices. What use do I have for ginger and coriander? She had said as she'd put them in a bag to donate to charity. And his parents wondered why he didn't do stuff for them. What was the point? It was never right anyway. Just two more months. The next morning, feeling pretty pleased with himself for getting his job back, Joel, shl shl eh, Joel slouched on one of the burgundy velvetteen uh, covered stools in front of the aircraft carrier size island in his mother's restaurant quality kitchen. For probably the 3000th time, Joel looked from his bowl of cold cereal to the flashy stainless steel appliances and the gleaming black granite countertops in his mother's kitchen. How did these two things make sense? About 10 years before, his dad had surprised his mum with this massive kitchen remodel instead of building Joel the soundproof music studio he wanted. His dad had brought all state-of-the-art this and top quality that, and Joel still got cold cereal six mornings a week. The only time he got a hot breakfast was on Sunday mornings before church and that was the and that was only because his dad was home. Monday through Saturday, Joel's dad left the house before dawn to get to the garden centre ready to open. Too often, Joel was expected to go in early with his dad. More than half the time he had the early shift he overslept. What normal person wouldn't? It wasn't natural to wake up when it was still dark. Joel ground his way through a second bowl of Fazbear Faz Crunch cereal, wishing the whole time it was something else, like curried eggs and bacon with hash browns. Maybe he should have gone over to Zach's house. Zach's mum always made what she called farmhouse breakfasts. I love this. Fazbear Faz Crunch. It's, it's more proof that if you put Faz in front of something, then it automatically makes it a FNAF story. <laughs> Fazbear Faz Crunch cereal. I want that. Glaring at your cereal isn't going to turn it into pancakes, or whatever you're wishing it was. Joel's mum said as she tossed a knitting magazine on the counter next to him and sat. Just because you don't eat breakfast doesn't mean you shouldn't feed your family breakfast. Joel grumbled. It's not fair to make me eat cereal every day because you think coffee is all a person needs in the morning. Joel's mum put down her magazine and turned to look at him. You have an interesting perspective, Joel, his mum said. He frowned at her. What's that mean? You've conveniently forgotten all the days you were little. When I got up early and fixed you eggs or pancakes or waffles or oatmeal, only to have you run down the little stairs, late as always, and yell, I don't have time, mama. Just give me cereal. After dumping a few dozen breakfasts down the garbage disposal, I got the message. She pointed at his cereal box. That's what you wanted. That's what you'll get. Yeah, well, it sucks. And I don't think it's fair to punish me for something I don't even remember doing. His mum crossed her arms and raised an eyebrow at him. What happened to, I get that I need to make some changes. She did a really good impression of his voice as she shoved the previous night sucking up back in his face. She took a deep breath, then frowned and shook her head. You didn't bother to shower this morning, did you? As usual. Joel pressed his lips together, again with a showering. His mother was obsessed with cleanliness. I didn't have time, he said. But you have time to sit here and grouse about the food you're eating, which was provided to you free of charge, by the way. Joel wanted to say something snarky to that, but he knew anything he said would get back to his dad. When his dad had agreed to let him come back to work, it had come with a warning. You'd better keep your nose clean. No slacking off. No back talk. So Joel kept his mouth shut. 
His mum wrinkled her nose and picked up her coffee and her magazine. I think I'm going to take my coffee up to my office and read my magazine in peace. Whatever, Joel muttered. His mother stood next to the island for a moment and stared at him. Then she sighed and left the kitchen. Joel rolled his eyes and grimaced at the old at the couple soggy bits of faz crunch that floated in his bowl. He'd already had two bowls of the stuff, and he was still hungry. He picked up the bright red box and, putting his thumb over Freddy Fazbear's face, tried to shake a third bowl's worth from the near-empty box. A couple more cereal bits fell out, along with something small and yellow, wrapped in cellophane. Cellophane? I don't know what that is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, right. The toy prize inside every box. Oh, this is actually about the cereal. Oh my god. Fishing the prize out of the milk with his spoon and spraying the counter with milk in the process, Joel looked at the toy. Was that? He wiped the, the cellophane on the napkin lying next to his cereal bowl and tore open the wrapping to see the toy more clearly. It couldn't be what he thought it was. Ah, oh, was it the kid? Is it the kid? The plastic toy clattered onto the counter and Joel flinched. It was what he'd thought it was. The toy was a miniature version, yes, of the same freaky yellow plastic kid-shaped figure that he'd hit with his truck yesterday. Just like that figure, the toy held an orange triangular flag that read Kids at Play. Just like that figure, the toy had slow printed across its hips under a red reflector. It had the same orange hat, the black eyes, the gaping mouth. The thing was identical in all respects, except it was for its size to the plastic figure Joel had hit. Identical. Even to the way it made him feel when he looked at it. The thing seriously weirded him out. That's, that's just, that's just whacked, Joel said out loud, as if to snap himself out of it. What were the odds? Why would anyone even make a toy that looked like that stupid kid figure? Joel shivered, then flicked the stupid toy off the counter with his index finger. It hit the floor with a clickety-click, slid across the polished hardwood and landed between a heat register vent and the baseboard trim in the corner of the kitchen. Joel looked at it for a couple seconds and left the kitchen, leaving his empty bowl and the empty cereal box on the counter, as he always did. He figured, if he had to eat cereal every day, it served his mother right to have to clean up the dregs of it. Joel glanced at the clock over the stove. He'd better get a move on. He was going to be late for school. One more official tardy notice, and he'd have to do after-school detention. If he got detention, he couldn't work. Without work, he couldn't get the money he needed. Life seriously sucked. Nothing you wanted came without paying for it. And when your parents wouldn't pay for the stuff you wanted, you had to get the money yourself. That meant you spent most of your life doing crap you didn't want to do. Just to eventually have enough money to do something you did want to do. But by then... You didn't have enough time to do what you wanted because you were working to pay for it. Life seriously sucked. Nothing you wanted came without paying for it. Damn it. it it's happened again. <laughs> Joel barely made it to school on time and after school he barely made it to work on time. Once there, he had to stay until 6pm exactly. Actually, he stayed until 5 minutes after just to be sure his dad got the point that he wasn't slacking. He had to do the same thing the next day, and the next day, until finally, it was Friday. At 6.08pm, Joel trudged toward his truck, muttering under his breath and kicking gravel as he went. His dad wanted Joel at work early the next morning to load up a special order for delivery, on a Saturday morning. That wasn't fair at all. His dad knew Joel and his friends liked practicing late on Friday nights. Joel would be wiped in the morning, and now he couldn't sleep in. The worst part was that he couldn't even complain, because he'd promised not to. But if his promise meant late evenings and early mornings, then he... Ow! Watch what you're doing, young man. Joel lifted his eyes and looked around. He groaned when his gaze landed on old Mrs. Linden. At least 90 years old, Mrs. Linden was this bony old lady who'd visited the garden centre at least once a week. Gardening keeps the bones young, she said, every single time she came to buy a new plant or a new tool. The woman repeated herself over and over and over again. This was especially tiresome since Mrs. Linden was a talker. 
She rambled constantly about everything that was going on in her life, about her grown kids and their problems, about her aches and pains and doctor's appointments, and, of course, about every minuscule thing that happened in her huge garden. The bees have been hovering around my forsythia more than usual. I nearly cut a caterpillar in half when I was planting the new alyssum. <laughs> One of the branches broke on my tam juniper. Who the hell cared about all this stuff? Joel sure didn't. He hated listening to this old lady's cracked voice. And on top of Mrs. Linden constantly running her mouth, she was a complainer. She found fault with something every time she came in, and his dad always bent over backward to make her happy. Joel cringed every time he had to listen to one of their exchanges, which always went something like, Those seeds don't sprout on schedule, Stephen. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Linden. Here's a new packet of them on the house. Or this. My hyacinths aren't as rich in colour as I hoped they'd be, Stephen. I don't believe the fertiliser is doing its job. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Linden. How about I give you a small bottle of another type of fertiliser for you to try? No charge. After witnessing this several times, Joel had finally asked his dad, Why does she bother coming here all the time if our stuff sucks so bad? His dad smiled and shook his head. It's just her way. She buys more than I give to her. She buys much more than I give to her. Now Mrs. Linden was levelling her grey-eyed, squinty stare at Joel. You do realise that your casual gravel kicking just resulted in a divot in my fender, Mrs. Linden said, pointing at a microscopic speck in the pale blue paint of her ancient Ford LTD. The thing was a boat on wheels. Joel opened his mouth to tell her where to stick her divot, but out of the corner of his eye, he saw his dad step out of the garden centre. Joel and Mrs. Linden were close enough to his dad that his dad could hear what they said. Joel blew out air and bent over to brush his thumb over the speck. Thankfully, the speck was dirt, not a divot. I'm very sorry, Mrs. Linden, he said, practically choking on every word. I shouldn't have been so... Uh, so careless. It's just a bit of dirt, not a divot. How about if I wash your car for you tomorrow after I get off work? Mrs. Linden beamed. That, w that would be lovely, young man. She shuffled over to Joel's dad. A nice boy you have there. Joel's dad quirked his lips but nodded. Joel rolled his eyes and dashed to his truck as soon as Mrs. Linden took another step toward his dad. Jumping into the cab, he snuck his key in the ignition and commanded, Start! Amazingly, it did so on the first try. Joel put the truck in gear and because he could almost literally feel his dad's gaze on him, he backed up slowly. He ever so carefully turned the wheels to head out of the parking area. He was towing the line perfectly today, so much so that it was the first thing he said to Zack when he pulled up next to Zack's family's old barn. Zack was outside, at the corner of the barn, putting seeds in the bird feeder when Joel arrived. Joel could see Zack had already spread out fresh hay for the goats. One of the goats, Missy, a tan-coloured nanny who would eat your clothes if you didn't wash her, was already chowing down. The air smelled similar to the way the nursery smelled. It reeked of dirt and manure with a, just a hint of sweetness that came from the honeysuckle growing against the faded and warped boards along the bun's south wall. Dude, Joel called out as he got out of his truck. I'm towing the line today. How about you? Zack turned and laughed. Nah, I'm stomping all over the lines. Joel turned and reached through the cab of his truck and grabbed the handle of his battered guitar case. Everyone here? He asked Zack. Zack shook his head and his long straw-coloured hair flipped across his face. He brushed it aside with a large hand. Zack was a big guy, even taller than Joel. He was the kind of dude you didn't want to cross. The centre of the high school the centre on the high school football team, Zack's muscle mass didn't come from working out. It came from working on his parents' farm. He was incredibly strong. He was also a great musician. He didn't look like it because he was big, tanned, and had rough figures. That's figures? Features. But Zack could play the piano and keyboard with more heart than anyone Joel had ever heard. Zack closed the lid on the bird feeder. Oh my god! 
<laughs> oh, are you kidding me? Why is Evan back? Isn't this the third time we've seen an Evan? Right? First one in The Real Jake, second one in Together Forever, third one here. Oh my god. Okay. Evan's girlfriend had a thing. He'll be here in an hour. We don't need him. I can sing League until he gets here. Figured. Peter come yet? Joel asked. I'm starved. Wes talked me into waiting to order so it won't be cold when Evan got here. Zack headed into the barn and Joel followed him. 